as a weapon for the hunter. They've never been bettered. As examples of a master craftsman's skill, they've rarely been equaled. One man took complete command of the art and science of gun making. He left an indelible mark, a name which still resounds across the centuries. Has any single man-made device done more to shape the course of human history than the gun? From its earliest beginnings, with weapons that were slow to use, heavyweight and inaccurate, to the fast-firing, deadly rifles of more recent conflicts. The killing power of modern-day firearms is awesome. Generations of master craftsmen have driven forward the technology of gun making. Even among gunsmiths today, the 18th century English master Joseph Manton is regarded as the best of the best. A craftsman who built high-priced guns for kings and princes. Deadly dueling pistols for quarrelsome noblemen, but then lost his fortune, went to prison and died in poverty. Gone but not forgotten. This was the king. I mean, he was, he was the king of the gun business. Any fool can make a fowling piece, and many are the fools that do. Some ask why the products of Joseph Manton Esquire command the price of 70 guineas or more. And I tell them to ask instead the gentlemen of discernment who count themselves fortunate to own such pieces and count them a bargain too. Joseph Manton set standards for craftsmanship and technical innovation, which every gunsmith since has striven to match. Some parts of the gun making process remain much the same. The delicate and intricate carving of the wooden barrel mounting, For the stock, only walnut will do, a wood now so rare that this piece alone in its raw state cost 1,000 pounds. From the team of master craftsmen trained by Joseph Manton 200 years ago, three apprentices went on to found gun-making workshops which still exist in London today. Holland & Holland, Boss & Company, and here, Purdy's, founded by Manton's apprentice, James Purdy. For over 150 years, they've produced sporting guns for the same strata of society whom Joseph Manton served, the rich, the powerful, the royal. People who are prepared to wait years for a gun to be tailor-made. When we're making large caliber double rifles for African shooting, you know, African game, um, and this can take up to anything up to nearly three years. As Joseph Manton's customers found, quality costs. Something over £50,000 for the privilege of owning one of these shotguns. This gun is about to be delivered to its owner. The final series of checks include measuring the trigger weight, the amount of pressure needed to fire the gun. Checking the cartridge eject mechanism. Then, finally, the gun is test fired into a special device which absorbs the power of the shot.
It passes the test. Soon this gun will be out in the field. Thanks to Joseph Manton, England is still widely regarded as the home of the top-class sporting gun. And the spirit of the master still inspires English gunsmiths. A master gunmaker himself for more than 30 years, David Winks treasures his own 200-year-old Joe Manton shotgun, valued at around £10,000. To assemble the gun, we take the stock and we put the hooks of the breech ends into the space, push the barrels down and that will need just a gentle tap and then place in the locks. There is the right There is the left, there's only one screw. Push it in, there we go. We pick up our turn screw. There's no screwdrivers in the gun business, it's a turn screw. And very carefully, it fits perfectly, that turn screw, so we don't scratch any of the sides. It's chisel shaped, and it goes in perfectly. Put it on half cock. And there we go. So why are the skills of Joe Manton so revered by the experts? Peter Smethurst is one of Britain's leading firearms historians. His guns were the epitome really of gun making at that time. All the effort went into making a quality item. Whether you view it from a point of view of a piece of engineering, in the lock mechanism, or in the barrel, or in the way they're all fitted to the wooden stock, in the making of the stock itself. Everything is flawless, and that's the way it had to be for Joe. Born in 1766, Joe Manton set up his London gun-making workshop at the end of what's often called the gunpowder age, when all guns were still what's known as muzzle loaders. The muzzle loader used loose gunpowder poured into the barrel end with either a single lead ball or smaller pellets known as shot rammed down on top. Muzzle loader enthusiasts like these go hunting just as they did in the 18th century. Shotguns were used by sportsmen predominantly for small game, rabbits, pheasants, uh, pigeons, woodcock, whatever else. And the advantage of it was that the shot, whilst it remained in a cluster in the barrel, as soon as it left the barrel, the shot began to spread out. So if you're aiming at a pigeon, which is maybe 30 yards away, and it's in flight, you have more chance of hitting it with a cluster of shot than with a single solid ball. In a military sense, most military weapons tended to fire a solid ball. If you can imagine in the 18th century, you had mass ranks of infantry, each with a musket facing another mass rank of infantry. A lead ball was going to do a lot more damage at 100 yards than a hail of very, very small pellets. With either shotgun or musket, the science behind the muzzle loaders of Manton's time was straightforward enough. This is gunpowder and this is how it works. Once ignited with a flame or even a spark, that small amount of solid turns instantly into a huge amount of gas. This time, the gas has been allowed to escape. But put exactly the same amount of powder into a confined space, and the result is dramatically different. In the confined space of the gun barrel, the only place for the explosive gases to go is out of the open barrel end, forcing out any projectile that's been rammed in on top of it. 
But every single gun produced during the gunpowder age had a design flaw that made shooting then far more difficult than shooting with modern weapons. It's the delay between pulling the trigger and the gunpowder actually igniting. Though it seems almost instantaneous, watch what happens when the process is slowed down by a factor of 10. The huntsman takes aim, following a bird in flight. He squeezes the trigger. But that double flash reveals the time between firing and the shot actually leaving the barrel. Why should it matter? If you're firing at a moving target, you take aim, you pull the trigger, and there's a perceptible time lag between pulling the trigger and the gun actually going off. And if, if it's a pigeon or something moving very quickly, then by the time you've fired, it's over there somewhere, it's out of sight. For a sportsman, aiming at a moving target that's moving across the field of fire, then you need to minimise that delay as much as possible. Joe Manton speeded up the ignition process, and it was that, more than anything else, that made Manton's gun so much sought after. By Joseph Manton's time, gunsmiths had been wrestling with the problem of achieving a faster means of ignition for 400 years. The first method they tried was called the matchlock. This is one of the earliest mechanisms usable by one person in the shape of the matchlock musket. This is the match, which is rope soaked in a substance called saltpetre. But once you've lit it, you keep the match in your left hand out of the way and away from your bandolier so it doesn't drop sparks all over you. The next thing down is the serpent, so called because it bears a passing resemblance to a snake and the jaws of the serpent are used for taking the lit match into the pan when you pull the trigger. So this is the pan. In there you put a little bit of gunpowder to prime uh, and uh, use as ignition uh, for the charge. In between the pan and the barrel there's a small hole called a touch hole and that's used to take the initial charge, if you're lucky. Occasionally it does become blocked uh, and that's where you get a flash in the pan but it's fairly reliable. And then you have the body of the weapon, the barrel and the butt, trigger and trigger guard. What you do is open your pan, pour a little powder into the pan to prime it, close the pan, tap off, blow off any excess, because you don't want any loose sparks down there, loose powder down there catching sparks, as you pour the rest of the powder down the barrel. You then put the ammunition in, which is a solid lead ball. You then withdraw your scouring stick, not the ramrod, the scouring stick, the cleaning stick, and ram your charge home. Remember to only use your fingertips so that if there's an explosion, you don't lose your whole hands. Return the scouring stick, bring the musket back up, take the burning tip of the match and put it into the jaws of the serpent. Test that it is going to hit the right place, which is why you need a closed pan and no powder and then come to high port. Your right hand is protecting the pan from any stray sparks, but it's also a visible signal to your musket captain that you're loaded and ready to fire. And when he gives you the, uh, the order to fire, you take half step towards the enemy, point in the general direction, check your scouring stick, open the pan, and that's it. The matchlock held sway for over 200 years, though the delay between squeezing the trigger and firing still made it wildly inaccurate. It was late in the 17th century that gunsmiths developed the firing mechanism which crowned the gunpowder age, the action which Joseph Manton refined to its utmost, the flintlock. Firearms expert Peter Cashman has studied the development of the flintlock. Oh.
So how did a Manton flintlock work? Now this is the frizzen, or steel as it's known. This is the flash pan, this is the cock, this is the flint. Some people think that it's the flint that creates the sparks. Well, it is the flint that creates the sparks, but it's not sparks coming off the flint, it's sparks coming off the face of the frizzen. The powder is put in the flash pan, the frizzen or steel is lowered onto the, the powder, the fine priming powder, and then when the flint comes down, it scrapes across the frizzen face, driving it forward, exposing the powder, sparks fall into the flash pan, they ignite the powder, the powder flashes and it shoots through into the main gunpowder charge which is inside the barrel. Now if I demonstrate that, we lower the frizzen onto the flash pan, we cock and when the flint comes down you'll see the sparks fall into the pan. Here's what's happening, slowed down 50 times. Those sparks are in fact sheards of white hot metal which are being scraped off the face of the steel. They're white hot, it happens so fast that they are white hot and they fall into the flash pan which ignites the gunpowder. Oh. Joe Manton had spotted a way to make the flintlock fire faster. Here's a normal barrel, more or less round at the breech end. And here's a Manton barrel. A section has been cut away. This simple idea was to have a dramatic effect. Whereas most flintlocks uh, will come along and let's just taper in, this is reduced in depth. There's, a, there's a quite a large step. Normally they're another quarter of an inch out. By putting this step, Joe Manton put the touch hole nearer the chamber. Therefore the flash had less area to travel because it was much closer to the chamber. Just by removing probably half the wall thickness at the breech of the gun, just by that simple step, he speeded up the ignition process. And indeed, that technique was copied by many. But it was Manton's improvement, it was Manton's patent, it was his idea. And that revolutionized in many ways the use of the flintlock gun for sporting purposes you got a quicker charge going down the barrel, you were quicker on the aim, you were quicker in the air, uh, you probably got the bird. Time to put Manton's invention to the test. Of course, you know, the moment it reaches it's that, testimony to the it, master's it craftsmanship well that gunsmiths well, don't merely well, admire his guns. Well. It's, it's so quick, quick. It, it really is, yeah. They can fire them as well, 200 yeah. years after they were made. So put it to your shoulder, Jim. Wonderful, isn't it? You can't miss. It's an expensive gun. And every time I shoot it, it probably knocks a fibre off the value. Um, but um, it's so wonderful to shoot. And I shoot it about two, three times a year, that's all. I've set the powder flask at two drams. Uh, it is regulated from two to two and a half drams, but two will be sufficient. So first of all, I invert it, check that it's full. To compress the gunpowder, a small fibre wad will be rammed down on top. And we drive him down. And here we have the shot flask, which is graduated. 
I'm going to put in uh, one ounce, uh, but I can put in an ounce and a quarter if I want. So we invert it, cut it off, it is full. And I pour in. On top of the lead shot, a second fibre wad, once again helping to build up pressure when the gas expands. The gun is still not ready to fire. A small amount of powder must be sprinkled in the flash pan. And now I will close the pan and put to full cock. Here's what happens in a slow motion shoot off. First, a regular flintlock. Then the Manton gun. That speed difference was small, but vital. Unlike today, when military science is at the cutting edge of technology, uh, in the development of firearms, particularly in the 18th century and, and certainly in the 19th century, they were largely driven by the needs of the sportsmen. On the battlefield, more often than not, the target is coming towards you. You have two opposing ranks of infantrymen, they're moving towards each other. There's no or very little lateral movement, so the delay on ignition isn't really crucial. So there was no need to refine the military musket in that particular way. Manton patented the improvement. It was only one of a series of inventions, which combined with the unrivaled craftsmanship of Manton himself and the gunsmiths he'd trained, made his guns the talk of the shooting world. A piece should be light, trim and fast handling. And the effect overall should be one of restraint and elegance. And when properly pointed, I assure you, a Manton piece will surely hit its mark. Muzzle loaders were complex devices, much less reliable than modern firearms. Change of flint. Another Manton invention, at least, made them safer to use. This is a particularly unusual uh, form of Manton gun. It's a coaching carbine. Probably not for use on your, your run-of-the-mill stagecoach, but for the private coach of a fairly wealthy person. Uh, because only the wealthy could afford guns by Manton. Now guns like this, any muzzle loading gun, is generally loaded with the barrel in the vertical position so the powder can be poured in, the shot or the ball rammed home, and usually this is done with the cock pulled back. Now on a normal gun there's always the risk that it might fly forward again and ignite the powder, fire the gun, and the obvious safety consequences. What Manton did was to introduce what he called gravitating stops, and it's basically it's a simple weight-operated safety device fitted on the outside of the lock. So when the hammer is pulled back to full cock, the stop there falls into place, engages with a notch, and the gun cannot be fired. But once it's loaded and ready for firing, by bringing it up to the shooting position, the counterbalance weight on the safety stop pulls it out of the line and then the gun can be fired in a normal way. Oh! Joseph Manton understood all about English weather. These modern shooters are okay, but during the gunpowder age, a sportsman's worst enemy oh. was the rain. In this particular lock, because it's Joe Manton, there's an awful lot in it. This uh, is a waterproof pan. What do we mean by that? 
in closing the frizzen, you'll see that if it was any water, if it was raining, would run around here, it would run down there, it would run down there, it would run over there, the, that lip there. It doesn't actually get into the pan. For the stagecoach gun, which had to operate outside in all weathers, Manton designed a complete drainage system. It has Manton's patent waterproof breaching, which consists of two slots cut either side of, of the barrel rib, which allows water to drain through there and run out through a hole at the bottom just in front of the trigger guard. So when it's in the firing position, water will drain and run through. Joe Manton patents followed one after another. As the unchallenged master, his customers were the cream of English society. Joe Manton had as patrons very powerful and wealthy people, and royalty even. Uh, Manton himself made guns for King George III, King George IV. He would treat them with disdain if, if they tried to push him. I mean, if they questioned their bill or anything like, you know, uh, uh, it, he would be quite affronted that someone would dare suggest that he was doing something improper, you know, by delaying delivery for a, two or three months. He didn't give delivery dates. He might say, well, it might be ready in six months' time or four months' time or whatever. But he wouldn't hold himself to that date if, by doing so, it meant skimping on the quality of what he was making. This is why I think they stuck with him, uh, because he was so brilliant. He was such a wonderful, wonderful gun maker. He was such a wonderful inventor. I have never counted it sufficient to merely repeat what one has done before. Though, surely, I could grow rich in that manner. No, Joseph Manton is both an exemplar of ancient traditions of craftsmanship and an innovator, an inventor, and, I may say, a man of science, too. Like a true scientist, Manton studied the way that people shoot and noticed a curious phenomenon. It's a bird. Most times, when less experienced shooters missed the target, it was because they'd fired too low. That's because the shot, once it's left the barrel, begins to lose momentum and falls off target. Manton's solution, a gun which made them aim higher without even realizing it. Another of Manton's inventions was what was known as the elevating top rib. The, the rib of a double gun is a, a strip of metal which runs between the barrels. And as you can see on this one here, the rib at the muzzle is almost flush with the top of the barrels. It's, it's very, very flat. Whereas at the breech of the gun, it's raised, probably by about 3 sixteenths of an inch. The effect of that was when you take sight along the barrel, the muzzle is slightly raised because of the geometry of that thicker rib at the back of the gun. And that brings the muzzle up. It makes you aim slightly higher. And that allows for the fall of shot as it travels through the air towards the bird. Manton's clever devices helped turn beginners into marksmen. Shooting clubs sprang up where sportsmen could test their skills and win or lose huge sums of money. Nowadays, sportsmen fire at discs, known as clay pigeons. In Manton's time, it was the real thing. The competition was live birds that were released. They flew off and they were shot down in, with a certain area. Well. They would shoot for a lot of money by today's standards. It would not be impossible for a £500 prize to be shot for 
in a live pigeon competition. You had even Americans coming to shoot in competition over here. These gun clubs were very, very special indeed. And of course, everybody went to them, all the top people. And this is where Manton picked up clients. 500 pounds then, around 35,000 pounds today, or $60,000 for those American marksmen. That's why Manton could charge the equivalent of eight to 10,000 pounds for his guns. In high society, they were a must have. There was the novelty element of certain improvements which often didn't improve the gun at all. But this, this idea of, of wanting something that was novel, something that was new, something that you could show off to your friends, certainly drove a lot of curious developments among firearms. But in Manton's case, what it drove were, were fundamental changes in the way in which they were made to perform. Very nice. When there was a point of honour to be settled, Manton guns also proved the most deadly. Weapon, sir? The dueling pistol was designed to be lightweight, easily handled, an elegant weapon associated with what was seen as an elegant occupation. The duel itself was an honourable thing to do. But as soon as you fired the gun, the recoil would tend to make the, the muzzle just tip upwards slightly, often called muzzle flip. And by doing that, it threw it off target. That was really down to the gun or the barrel, particularly being so lightweight. What Joe Manton developed was the heavy barrel pistol. Ready, gentlemen? You drew the pistol up, and the aim was almost intuitive. Because the, the gun was so much heavier, the effect of the recoil was drastically reduced and you could hit the target. It became a vogue almost to become a good pistol shot using one of Manton's pistols. Joseph Manton was an undoubted genius. He'd become wealthy as the unchallenged master of the gun trade, and he was a tireless inventor. He even designed a chronometer, a clock for use at sea to help ships navigate, though his design was ultimately rejected by the British Navy. He believed that in most matters technical, he knew all the answers, and probably did. But his genius led him to venture outside the law. English firearms manufacture was, and still is, governed by a strict set of safety laws. But Joseph Manton believed that he knew best. When it came to making gun barrels, Manton believed that he had no equal. Modern shotgun barrels like these are made from a single piece of forged steel, which is drilled out to roughly the required width or bore. They're then carefully polished and filed, both on the inside and the outside, until they meet exactly the required dimensions. The techniques for forging steel tough enough for gun barrels and the machinery to produce them didn't exist in the 18th century, and so they were made by hand in a completely different way. Finely patterned barrels like these were what's known as Damascus forged, since the technique originated in the Middle East. 
the metal for the gun barrel actually came from old horseshoe nails, which had fallen from horses' hooves, and in the horse-powered 18th century, could be found in large quantities on the street. Gun makers, like any other craftsman, wanted to get the most for their money, and if they could use scrap iron, they would do. There was no reason why they shouldn't. It, it was of the same quality as any iron bought from the uh, iron warehouses. Hundreds of nails at a time were then heated in a forge and welded into a solid bar. Because of this unique process, the resulting steel was tougher and also contained colour variations to provide the pattern in the finished barrel. The next step was to hammer the bar into a ribbon of steel, which was then wound around a barrel-shaped mould called a mandrill. Here's a rare example of a half-completed barrel. Iron at that time had rather a, a grainy structure, rather like wood. And in the same way that wood is stronger along the grain than across it, iron is likewise. So by wrapping it around a mandrel, the grain of the iron runs around the circumference of the tube. That is where it's best placed to resist the forces of the explosion. Once they were polished smooth, the barrels took on the unique Damascus pattern. Beautiful to look at, but how well could they withstand the enormous forces of firing? A gun barrel has to withstand a pressure of anything between 10 and 17 tonnes per square inch. That is a tremendous pressure by anybody's reckoning. Because of an ancient law in force today, just as it was in Joseph Manton's time, every gun barrel made in Britain has to pass a rigorous strength test, known as proving, to ensure that it doesn't explode when fired for real. There was a lot of rogue guns being made that the steels weren't, uh, and the metal of the barrels weren't up to the job and were bursting. Uh, and therefore they set up a proof committee and houses so that every firearm that was made had to have a proof mark. For over 300 years, tests have been carried out here at the London Proof House. Inside, under tight security, guns are stacked waiting to be tested. The process has changed little since Manton's time. The only major difference, now cartridges are used instead of the loose gunpowder used in muzzle loaders. The cartridges contain an extra powerful charge to stress the barrel beyond its normal limits. The shot will go harmlessly into this energy absorbing box. Once the gun is in place on the test bed, the technician will withdraw to a safe place to fire the gun remotely. The barrels are then checked to see if they've distorted. If all's well, they're given a proof mark, a symbol cut into the barrel that proves they've passed the test. Failures are rare, but imagine if this had happened when this gun was in use. The mystery of many surviving Joseph Manton guns is where are those vital proof marks? When Manton got the barrels back from the proof house, he filed them down on the outside to remove the weight to make the gun handle better. And in the process, for some reason, Unknown to us, he removed the proof marks. Or could it be, as some suspect, that Manton's guns were never sent for testing in the first place? If I'm correct, Manton was breaking the law of the land by not proving his arms. I polished thousands of gun barrels 
and polishing a proof mark, that removal of quite a lot of metal, it really is. You're talking probably 10 or 12,000 an inch. I don't think he bothered. I think that once he put his name on it, that was good enough. It's one more sign of the immense respect which Manton inspired, that for 200 years, shooters have been happy to blast away with guns that may never have been through that original safety test. Fabulous. Have any Joe Manton barrels blown up? Probably yes, but probably because they were incorrectly loaded. His bows are wonderful, I know. I, I can uh, do know what I'm looking at with a gun barrel. Yeah. Manton was prepared to ignore the law, but not when it came to protecting his own patent inventions. He spent a fortune on legal cases, suing rival gun makers whom he claimed had copied his ideas. But what really speeded his financial ruin was his decision to pick a fight with the British Army. At first, he thought he was doing them a favor. Let it not be said that I have thought only of my own pocket in exercise and the gifts God has granted me. No, lately I have been working to perfect a device which will greatly serve the armed might of His Majesty's forces of artillery. A device to send the ball flying further and truer than has ever yet been seen. Manton had turned his mind to the problem of how to make a cannonball spin in flight, using the principle known as rifling. These gun barrels have been rifled, creating those tiny spiral grooves cut into the barrel wall. That makes the projectile spin. If you can imagine a child's spinning top or a gyroscope, once you've set it spinning, it's very difficult to push it off course. A child's spinning top, will you'll push it over, it'll come upright again. And the same principle applies to a, a spinning projectile flying through the air. For centuries, the military musket had been what's called smoothbore or unrifled. And they were highly inaccurate. Virtually all modern weapons are rifled and, in the right hands, deadly accurate. That was better. Spot on. 18th century gunsmiths were already beginning to develop ways of rifling the musket barrel but no one had solved the problem of doing the same thing on a giant scale with the cannon. The reason that the artillery started to develop rifling was because the infantryman could fire a rifled musket, which gave him greater range and accuracy. This enabled him to kill the artilleryman that was firing the gun. Now, the problem there was that the artilleryman couldn't fire back because their range wasn't as great. So they needed to develop rifling for that. Now, of course, there were lots of people trying to develop rifling. This one, you can see, is quite unusual. Um, you can see the spiraling at the top. And the idea with this is that it would be fired out of a smoothbore gun, and this area here would interact with the air pressure to make it spin. Now, there are no records to show whether it worked or not, and in my opinion, it probably didn't. Now something that was a bit more practical and that I think would have worked is this projectile here. It's a solid piece of shot. It's got two studs on it. This is the front and this is the back. Now if you had two bits of rifling, that's uh, bits cut into the bore, into the barrel of the rifle, that went down in a spiral, you would locate these two studs into the spiral. It would engage into the rifling, come out and be spun 
through the air, trying to stabilise it. How far it went, we don't really know. Joseph Manton sensed that this was where his fortune lay, solving the biggest problem in contemporary warfare and winning a huge government contract at the same time. The British Army even gave Manton a cannon to work on. It's been preserved at the Museum of the Royal Artillery. Here it is, Manton's gun. Started life off as a smoothbore muzzle-loading gun, but with his new rifling machine, he managed to cut the grooves into the barrel that you can see there. It was actually used in many of his experiments. Manton's solution was to attach a wooden collar to the cannonball with a powder charge attached below, the first self-contained shell. Cannonball at the front, wooden piece in the middle, gunpowder at the back, held together with strips of tin. Remember, this is going to bite into the rifling also, which would make the cannonball spin. And this would make it more accurate and go further. This was a good idea, and it actually worked. Now, Manton was happy to work with the government as long as he could make the wooden pieces. But the government did the dirty on him and decided to make them themselves. Manton then decided to pull out of the experiment. They intend to rob me. One farthing royalty is what I'm offered after so much expenditure of time and trouble. So, we shall see what the judges make of this. I shall have justice. The resulting lawsuit dragged on for many years. With this and his other court cases, Manton was squandering the profits of his hugely successful gun business until, one day, the money ran out. Sadly, he did die in poverty. He was uh, taken to the bankruptcy court. He was declared a bankrupt. He actually served a time in prison as a debtor. Now, for somebody who'd been at the pinnacle of the gun-making world at that time, that was a dreadful come down. He died almost unrecognised. Joe Manton was certainly a master gunmaker. His guns were, were masterful pieces of the gunmaker's art and craft of the time. They weren't meant as items of decoration. They may function as status symbols for the people who were privileged enough to own them. But they were not made for that purpose. They were made as guns to fulfil a function. Joseph Manton's legacy is the master craftsmanship still evident in the London gun trade. It's why his name is revered by those who make the guns today. Not only was he a brilliant gunmaker with his hands, he was also a brilliant gunmaker in his head, which is crucial. I'd love to speak to him for five minutes, but unfortunately, that's not possible. Instead, David Winks decided to pay his respects to Joe Manton in a very practical way, here at London's Kensal Green Cemetery. Like so many others, Manton's tomb had been allowed to decay. The proud epitaph placed there by Manton's friends in 1835 was completely unreadable. And so a group of London gunsmiths raised money to have the gravestone restored to its original condition. The inscription proclaiming Joseph Manton the master, as clear now as ever it was. We had this affinity to Joe Manton. We had to put that grave back exactly as it was because he was the king. And, and um, as Elvis was the king of music, um, Joe was the king of the gun trade.